So now in this final flowchart, we're going to complete our evolutionary landscape and complete the idea of unicont diversity by looking at the final tetrapod, the final amniote, the final chordate, the group of organisms known as mammalia. So before we get there, let's make sure we know where we're starting. We're starting at the chordate level. Okay, so we're looking at chordates. Uh, this is, I believe, chordates five now. And so from here, we're going to now focus on the tetrapods. We looked at the tetrapods in great detail prior to this. So this is basically tetrapods uh, part two. So we started with the amphibia, the most basal clade, then we went to reptilia, then we went to uh, the birds, the aves, some people call. That's the actual technical term for the bird clade. Now we're looking at still the amniotes, all of which that I mentioned before are amniotes except for the amphibia, um, but specifically within the amniotes. I remember I told you we are still amniotes, even though we don't lay eggs. We're looking at mammalia, okay? Now, mammalia. Let's look at some key characteristics. A lot of people know this uh, already because it is the characteristics that you and I possess, very much so. So the key characteristics. So mammalia possess mammary glands. That's really where the name comes from. Now, not all mammals possess this, but at least some of the mammals have the mammary glands, usually the females. So this is going to produce milk. I think of females all the time. I can't think of an example where they don't. So mammary glands produce milk. That's a key characteristic of a mammal. Okay. Another key characteristic is that we give birth to live young, aka we do not lay eggs. We give birth to live young. All the development happens um, within the uh, developing, let's say, fetus, developing embryo, whatever it be, it happens within the mother, and that is going to eventually culminate in the birth of an alive child, of an alive infant, uh, assuming all developmental processes occur correctly. Another key characteristic of mammals is that they have hair. I'm pretty sure humans have hair. And they also actually have this very nice structure very nice molecule known as fat. And fat is specifically going to be um, found as a layer, a specific fat layer under the skin. Now you might be thinking, oh, I hate the fact that that's present. Well, that is very important because it actually helps us as mammals retain heat. If we did not have this fat layer, we would die. That's the importance of this fat layer for the class of mammals that we're going to be studying, okay? Now, this does not mean that the fat layer, I'm not promoting a fat layer or an extensive fat layer. I'm just saying that there's a standard fat layer that all mammals have that helps us retain heat because fat layers will undergo cell respiration at a good rate, um, and that metabolic energy will provide us with a constant body temperature as exhibited by those endothermic qualities that we said in birds. But I digress. Moving forward, because of this retaining of heat, we are, of course, endothermic, just like the birds. And unlike the reptilia, right? And reptilia are ectothermic. And in addition, we're endothermic, and we also have a very noticeable, a very successful high metabolic rate, meaning that we do cell respiration at a very efficient uh, rate at a very efficient uh, overall pattern. So we'll just write this down as efficient cell RSP for respiration and also circulatory system, circ cis for circulatory system. So our blood rushes through our body very well because of our efficient circulatory system and then the blood within us is provides oxygen for all of our tissues to undergo cell respiration and cell respiration at a nice high metabolic rate. So very important key characteristics that make us mammals. Okay, so let's look at the specific classes of mammals that are of importance to us. The first one, the oldest one, the most basal of mammals are the monotremes. The monotremes are actually so weird because they actually lay eggs. It's an awkward uh, orientation of mammals because they are specifically the ones that are laying eggs for this reason. Remember what the class of organisms before the mammals did, aves and reptilia and amphibia? They all laid eggs. That would mean that the monotremes, because they continue to lay eggs, they are, must be ancestral. They must be closely related to those before them. 
They are ancestral mammals. They are very closely related to reptiles or birds, let's say, because of their still egg-laying capabilities. They do have hair, and they also do produce milk, so they are certainly mammals. That's the proof behind it. But the thing is, they are ancestral because this hair and milk, though produced, they actually do not have nipples. And yes, that is exactly why they are a ancestral mammal. Most mammals that produce milk have nipples for that milk uh, transfer to the baby, but these monotremes do not have nipples. Okay, so that's a nice fun fact to remember about monotremes. Uh, classic examples of this: um, a lot of times there are questions that ask you to classify a platypus, and a platypus on the out exterior at least does not looks nothing like a mammal, but still classifies itself as a mammal because of this characteristic right here and also an organism known as the echinida. Okay, uh, echi actually I spelled that wrong. It's an organism known as echinida. Okay, so those are our monotremes. Next in our evolutionary look at mammals is going from these laying egg-laying mammals towards now the marsupials. A lot of people already have a familiarity with marsupials. Marsupials are very cute little mammals. These are going to be mammals that do actually now have nipples. So they are much more, let's, let's say, much more evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily recent than our monotreme mammal ancestors. They give birth to live young. So they make that first transition, that big transition to giving birth to live young. The monotremes, they do not give birth to live young. But they're still mammals because they have more mammal characteristics than anything else. Basic idea behind them. So they give birth to live young. So an important thing about giving birth to live young is that you have a placenta. Uh, the, at least the female has the placenta, which is going to be an incredibly important point at which nutrient plus waste exchange can happen because usually an egg provides you know enough nutrients. It has a nutrient, let's say, layer for the developing embryo within it. But the placenta is basically that replication of that idea that there's going to be nutrients and also waste that this growing embryo needs and produces. And so there's going to be an exchange point through the placenta between the mother and the embryo. So that's a big characteristic that these marsupials are the first ones to develop. Mother and embryo, nutrient and waste exchange through the placenta, allowing the birth of live young. Now, the thing about marsupials is that though they give birth to live young, they actually give very early birth, okay? And this is going to make sense in just a second. So early, in fact, that you need to continue the development um, in the marsupium of the organism, thus the name marsupials, and if by process, hopefully you can figure this out, these marsupials have a marsupium, aka a pouch. So now you definitely know what type of animals we're talking about here. This pouch is going to be where the animal, the young, very, very still much, it's very still, uh, let's say, not fully developed animal, continues its development, okay? It goes in the pouch of the mother, and that's because it has a very early birth. The full development doesn't necessarily happen, let's say. Classic example are um, opossums. Uh, so we have possums. I want to make sure I spell this right. Okay, possums. We also have kangaroos and koalas. Lots of, think Australia for marsupials. So really, the classic example would be to think of Australian animals. So those are marsupials. Finally, we're going to finally conclude this very long lecture, this very expensive lecture, by talking about the eutherians. So you probably didn't know this, but you are a eutherian. These are going to be placental mammals. Okay, we check out on that, definitely. We are placental mammals. But what's going to differentiate us from our marsupial ancestors? These are placental mammals with more complex, more complex exchange system. So the placenta of us, of us as eutherians, is more complex than the placenta of the marsupials. Because we have a more complex placenta, we have more complex nutrition and waste exchange between the mother and the embryo. This results in this increased complexity, results in longer pregnancies. 
longer pregnancies results directly in greater embryonic development. There is so much great embryonic development that has to occur from the moment of fertilization of a zygote, single zygote, all the way to the expansive multicellular system filled, tissue filled organism that is an infant. It's incredible. It's a process that we'll talk about when we talk about reproduction, but these long pregnancies are typical examples of eutherians. That's it. That's all the things that we need to know about mammalia. Here's my little spiel about this lecture. There is a lot. I absolutely understand. There is so much to memorize in this lecture. It's crazy. I'm tired after doing this lecture. I think there are 13 or 14 flowcharts associated with it. Please keep in mind, just like anything in Gen Bio, the big picture, and please keep in mind the fact that we have these transitions from going from simple organisms to like something like a something like a, a protostome all the way to a deuterostome. It takes these evolutionary key characteristics to happen. Please, please appreciate the diversity of animals. That's what I really want you to walk away with after this. All of these animals that we looked at, be able to go outside, see an animal, and be able to do exactly what we did. Say, oh, that's a eumetazoan. And because it's a eumetazoan, it exhibits bilateral symmetry, and it has triploblast, and, uh, you know, it's a deuterostome. It's a protostome and it's uh, an arthropod. All of those things are going to allow you to apply the knowledge. Next time you see an animal, do that. Trust me, it's what I did. It sounds crazy, but it works, okay? It really helps you apply all of the things that you see and it really drives home the point that everything has a common ancestor in this animal phylogeny that we look at. Hopefully, this hasn't been too crazy. Hopefully, it hasn't been too much. Uh, and of course, I hope you have gained a greater appreciation for the incredible diversity. Believe it or not, this is just touching the surface of the diversity of the animal world.